Good morning, Southeast. Great to be in the house of the Lord together today on this fourth Sunday of Advent. And delighted that you're able to join us in person and then also on Facebook live stream. And I know some of you will be watching later on YouTube, but so glad to have all of you here today. And our opening scripture is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful morning that you have wakened us in to. We thank you for your grace, your goodness to us, and we thank you for Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we pray that as we come together this morning, that you would reveal yourself to us, help us to know you better, and we pray that everything would glorify you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. And Brother Eddie's going to come and lead us in some worship songs. Shepherds kept their watching over wandering flocks by night. Behold, from out of heaven, they find a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Say it again, say go tell it on the mountain. Over the hill and everywhere go, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And lo, when they had seen it, they all bowed down and prayed. They all traveled on together to where the child was laid. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere go, tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. Say it again, say go. Tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere go. Tell it in the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. 
Amen. Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Prospero año y felicidad Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Prospero año y felicidad I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas From the bottom of my heart I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas From the bottom of my heart Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Prospero año y feliz Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Feliz Navidad Prospero año y felicidad I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. You may be seated. And this time we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And our psalm this morning is Psalm number 89. And we're not going to read the whole psalm, but we're going to highlight the places that talk about God's promise to David. So Psalm number 89, as we move into prayer, Psalm 89. Psalm number 89. I think that's better. Psalm 89. Hear me better? All right. Psalm 89, beginning in verse 1. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. And then skipping down to verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They exalt in your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Once you spoke in a vision to your faithful people, you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have exalted a young man from among the people. I have found David my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. 
My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. No enemy will subject him to tribute. No wicked man will oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him. And through my name, his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens. Let us continue to pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be in your house this morning, grateful to be here together in your presence. Pray that you would have your way, that you would move in our midst, that you would be glorified. We recognize that you are the maker of this day, and we recognize that you are our creator, you have made us. And we are grateful that you have created us on purpose and with purpose, that we might glorify you, that we might reflect your goodness out into the world and to each other. And we pray that you would fulfill your purpose in us today. We thank you for how you care for us, how you hold us together, you sustain us. You brought us through another week, Lord, and we are grateful. And we just praise you, Lord, for your goodness to us. You have been enthroned above, but you stoop low, and you are mindful of our every care and our every need, and we thank you for that. Thank you for clothing, for food, for places to lay our head. Thank you for friends, for family. And Lord, when everything would seem to come undone, somehow you stretch your arms out around us and you hold us and you carry us through. And we're so grateful for that this morning. And Lord, we are especially grateful for the gift of salvation, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that we might be reconciled to you, that we might have peace with you, and that we might have the hope of the resurrection we thank you, Father, for this tremendous gift this morning. And we confess our sins to you. We confess our sinfulness to you. We confess that we continue to fall short of your glory. But we're so grateful that you do not abandon us, but that you are faithful to us to keep working with us. And you give us your spirit to grow us and to change us so that we become truer and truer reflections of you and that we become more faithful followers of Christ Jesus. And we pray that you would help us to imitate Christ in his trust in you, uh, living completely relinquished to you. And we pray that you would also help us to imitate Christ in terms of loving one another. And we pray that you would increase our love, that we would love each other well, that we would love each other deeply. Uh, Lord, help us with this, we pray. And then, Father, we pray that in the midst of all of that, that you help us not to get stuck on ourselves. It's so easy to get caught up in dreams and ambitions to where we don't see you and we don't see anybody else. And it's also easy to become trapped in feeling sorry for ourselves, uh, mistakes that we've made in the past, things that have happened to us. Uh, it's so easy to get caught there to where we don't see you and we don't see one another. Uh, we're just stuck there. We pray, Lord, that you would shift us out of such self-centeredness, uh, however that self-centeredness might express itself. And we pray that you would move us to a Christ-centeredness, to where our eyes would be upon Jesus and that we would be following Jesus by the power of your spirit. Thank you for blessing us with brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus who pray for us, who laugh with us, who cry with us, who listen. Uh, Lord, we're grateful. Help us to be faithful brothers and sisters to each other. And then, Lord, we bring all of our, all of our praises and pains to you today. Uh, Lord, we are grateful for so much. And we're especially grateful for this Christmas season, this Advent season, that you sent Jesus as a babe in a manger, that we might know you, and then had him die on the cross that we might be reconciled unto you, and then raised him from the dead that we might have a hope that goes beyond this life. Lord, such a gift. We are so grateful today. And then, Father, we bring all of our pains to you as well. And, Lord, we think of those who are dealing with illnesses, uh, some because of COVID-19, some because of cancer, some because of other ailments, uh, some acute, some chronic. But Lord, we bring, we bring our health to you, and we pray that you would touch and that you would bring healing and that you would sustain us. And then, Father, we pray that you would be with those who are grieving today, uh, grieving the loss of loved ones, grieving the loss of jobs, grieving broken family, grieving not being able to see family this Christmas, uh, Lord, wherever the source of grief might be coming from, whatever the loss, Lord, you are the one who comforts and you are the one who gives peace and gives strength for such times. 
And so, Lord, we look to you. And, Father, we pray for our city, our, our state. We pray for our nation, our world, such turbulent times. Um, Lord, we look to you. You are our hope. 2021 is not our hope, Lord. You are our hope. And we don't place hope in just being able to flip the calendar and it's a new year. No, we place our hope in you. And we pray, Father, that as we lean into you, we will discover once again just that you are the God who makes a way when it seems that there's no way and that there is such hope in you. And then, Father, we pray for your church wherever it's gathered today, certainly us on this corner, but also across the street and up the street, downtown. Thank you that Living Water was with us last week. Pray that you would be with churches around the globe today. Uh, Lord, pour out your spirit upon us that we might be faithful witnesses, that Christmas might kind of come to life through your church, that the world would recognize that a Savior has been born and is Christ the Lord, and they know it because they see us, your saved people. We pray, Lord, that you would just accomplish the fullness, fullness of your salvation in us, that we might be faithful witnesses to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank all of you again for being here today. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, and thank you for your faithfulness and giving. And thank you for your faithfulness in keeping in contact with each other, being a source of encouragement to each other. Uh, the, the Lord is good, and I see that in you and through you. And so thank the Lord for you. And today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and Pastor D is going to be bringing the word today. Usually when Pastor D is bringing the word, I'm out of town and I don't get to hear him live. And so I am excited to be able to hear Pastor D live today. And so he's going to bring the word in just a moment. Our Advent reading is in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. And Brother Beto is going to come and he is going to light the Advent candles, this beautiful Advent wreath. I wish you all could see it that Sister Vonda and Sister Nino worked on the past couple weeks. And so just delighted to have that. So Beto, if you'll light the candles. And Tony, if you will come and read Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. And then Pastor D is going to bring the word. Now all glory to God, who is able to make you strong, just as my good news Now all glory to God, who is able to make you strong, just as my good news say. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now as the prophets foretold and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere so that they too might be might believe and obey him all glory to the only wise god through jesus christ forever amen, amen. 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 i'll grab a mic good morning good morning how's everyone doing yeah. awesome awesome hopefully y'all can hear me well um if you will, would you turn with me to our text this morning? Our text is found in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, and we will be reading verses 1 through 17. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. And when you have it, say amen. amen. Awesome. Um, after the king had settled in his palace, the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar 
where the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this day. I have, moved, I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved and all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pastures and following the flock to the ruler, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest man on earth, and I will provide a place for my people and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done since the time I appointed leaders over my people. I will also give them rest from their enemies. The Lord de de declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and will come from your own body and I would establish his kingdom. And he um, will build a house for my name. And I would establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of man, with floggings inflicted by man. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, who I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your kingdom will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the word of this entire revelation. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we indeed do thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father, we do indeed thank you, Lord, to uh, be reminded uh, of your word this morning. And Father, we pray as we come before your word, uh, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts afresh, that you would uh, allow us to hear what it is that you would have for us to hear this day, this season uh, in our life. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's always uh, rather challenging to uh, begin a sermon, and I think at times it's challenging to end a sermon. Um, but today, uh, hopefully the word of God that we're going to uh, come before will speak to our hearts and minds. Um, before I get started, um, as it has become our custom, um, to propose a question, so a question that you all can just think about, um, those who are watching Facebook Live or at home, uh, just think real briefly about this question. Give you all 30 seconds, discuss it with someone at your table, um, stay social distancing, of course, and uh, just ponder real briefly on this question and then we'll get going with the sermon. Um, so the question this morning is, it's a fun question, don't get too serious. If you were to gift God with something, what would you gift him with? If you were to present God with a gift, what would you give him? All right, take 30 seconds and, and, and chat real briefly or think with it within your own hearts. All right, those who are here are, uh, have discussed uh, some that question. If you had to present the Lord with a gift, what would you present him? So um, it, at this point, probably is no surprise to you that um, our text today kind of have some of that within the text. I mean, here it is, King David, and we'll talk about him in just a moment. But here it is, King David, at this point, 
if you will. I know it's the season of Christmas and we usually present gifts to others, one another's friends or families. And I just think about just the text. Here it is that David is resting within his home and he decides, comes within his mind, his thoughts to say, I'm going to present the Lord with a gift. And he decides within his heart, mind, that I'm going to build the Lord a house. And it's almost as if David, as God's son, God's servant, is saying, Lord, I want to present you a gift and build you a house. As parents, many of you are parents, how would that sound if your children would come to you and say, Mommy, Dad, I want to build you a house? I mean, to all of us, at some point, that would probably be great that here it is, my child, after all that I have done, is deciding, okay, I want to present you a present and build you a home. But I don't want to just quickly jump into our text this morning because I think that it, it serves us well to kind of uh, have some context. So, you know, within the text kind of gives some context in terms of where we are in terms of Second Samuel chapter 7. And so one of the things that, I mean, we can go very far, and I hopefully I don't want to go too far today, but one of the things that, um, just preparing for the text today, one of the things that I continue to be reminded of is these five words. And this is kind of the title for the sermon today. Um, I, 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 I was reminded that he's still on the throne. And I'm going to say that one more time. He still on the throne in terms of God. God is still on the throne. And despite whatever is going on in our lives, oftentimes it, it hopefully that kind of that message, those five words will serve us well, that in the midst of whatever it is that we might be enduring, that a reassuring message that God is on the throne, that whatever we're going through, God has us. That, that, that whatever it is that we might be facing, everything will be all right. And I, I oftentimes know the situation in the moment seems pressing. The situation in the moment does not seem as if God is on the throne. But I want to reassure you today, if you leave with anything, leave with the reassurance and knowing that he's on the throne. No matter, no matter what comes before us as God's people, no matter what comes before your family, no matter what comes before your friends, he's still on the throne. I can't tell you just this week alone in the weeks past, just the countless of different phone calls that I received with people kind of voicing different pains and different things that's in their life, whether it be in terms of cancer, whether it be in terms of sickness, whatever the case is, as challenging as those situation is, He's still on the throne. And, and, and I hopefully that, that eases you in the midst of whatever it is that you might be facing. That, that, that God is not a God who will forsake his people. That he's a God who not only promises, but he fulfills and he's faithful to every single word that he promises. And this promise that we're going to see in terms of the promise to David, in terms of God building David a house, and that there will always be someone who is going to forever remain on the throne, God fulfills that promise. And we'll talk about the, the one in whom God fulfills that promise too soon, but I just wanted to stop and say to you, he's still on the throne. And, and, and then if you recall, just in terms of the history of the Israelites, here it is that God was raising up the Israelites to be God's people, to be the ones in whom would um, faithfully uh, make God's name known, not just in the place in which God had allowed them to abide, but throughout the whole entire world, that in and through the people, God would bless them, that they would become a blessing to all people. And we see how this promise is fulfilled, even or, or, or spoken even all the way back to Abraham, that, that, that this people that God is raising up would actually become God's chosen people to bless and be a blessing to the entire world. And in the midst of God serving them, in the midst of God loving them, in the midst of God blessing them, it almost seems rather strange that they would be requesting another king. Here, here, here it is that God is the God of his people, but yet 
in the midst of his favor, in the midst of his mercy and grace upon their life, they requested a different king. If you take back in terms of the history of the Israelites. And, and in this moment, God raises up a man by the name of Samuel. Samuel. He becomes a prophet of God's people. And, and one of the things that in this moment is even just the, um, the words from the Israelites that they requested a different king, that displeased Samuel himself. It, it displeased him to the point where he went before the Lord in prayer. And the Lord kind of spoke back to Samuel in the midst of him being displeased and said, the people are not rejecting you, but they're rejecting me. And, and you think about that. After all that God has done for his people, you would think that his people will continue to be obedient and serve him and see everything that he has done. I, I want to stop there for a moment. How often in life, after all that God has done, after all God continues to do, how often do we fail to recognize that he's still on the throne? How often do we fail to recognize that God is our God? That, that, that no matter what is before us or surround us, no other God is like our God. And, 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 and here it is that God has been, again, he, God has been blessing them and they just want it to be like everyone else. I, I jokingly said they wanted to be like the Joneses, but truthfully, they wanted to be like the surrounding nations in which they were surrounded by. But God was trying to raise them up to be a people that would rightly reflect his image into the, the rest of the world. But make us a king. And so the Lord, I'm sure, grieving in his own heart, raised up a king. And we know that king was Samuel, uh, Saul. He became the first king, and I will go quickly with Saul's history. But eventually, Saul eventually did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just like the people. And you can just imagine that here it is. He's supposed to be the king. He's the one who's supposed to be guiding and directing God's people and serving God rightly so that the people might also serve God rightly. But due to him not serving God rightly, the people also failed to serve God rightly. And so God eventually, through his disobedience uh, to God, short version, he removes Saul off the throne. And in the midst of removing Saul off the throne, he was raising up another king. And this little king was just nothing but a shepherd boy. And we know and we introduce to David because he's in the field watching over his father's sheep. And he's the last son of Jesse. I often joke to myself that I am the last son of my father, Jesse, and I'm the 13th child. David, here he is. He's the last son of Jesse as well. I'm not the king. David becomes the king, but I don't know. But yes, here it is in this moment. God is raising up David from being a shepherd of the flock to actually being a shepherd over God's people. And I realized that, and I started to think about David's history, and I said, wow. Only God can do that. Only God can take David from where he was to bring him to a place where God wanted him so that he can begin to use him to glorify God. And I think about that in our own life. Only God can take us from where we are, the situations that we find ourselves in, and move us to a place where we ourselves cannot even imagine or think. And only he can do that. And, and, and God reminds David, even in through our text today, God reminds David of where he brought him from. And I think about going back to Saul just real briefly. One of the things that I think about in terms of King Saul, he forgot who raised him up. I'm going to say that again. Saul forgot who raised him up. Okay, maybe you don't, you don't get, you, you're not getting that. All right, I want you to think in terms of a parent and a child relationship. Oftentimes, after a parent has done all their due diligence and raised up a child, oftentimes the child might go a separate way and forget all that the parent has done and forget the one who has raised them up. And Saul himself, being raised up by God, forgot who was on the throne. Even though Saul was the king on the throne, earthly throne, God was still on the throne. And, 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 and Saul himself needed to continue to submit himself daily to God so that he might faithfully guide the people in God's way. 
And I think about that in terms of us. Have we forsaken or have we forgotten the one who's on the throne? Because, because I believe that the Lord continues to raise his people up and he continues to raise us up even today. But in the moment, in the midst of God raising us up, have we forsaken or forgotten the one who's raised us up? And, and I just pray again, as you hear these words, I pray that it was not only just soften our hearts, but really would take us to a place that would guide us to truly say, Lord, I truly want to be obedient to you. And we know that obedience is better than any sacrifice. Yeah, we, we have those scriptures. We have the text. But truly, is God the one who's on the throne? And, 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 and not just in terms of the throne, the throne of your heart. It, 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 is he the one that reigns in your life? And I think about David. Again, I think about David in his history. David became and God was raising him up to become a man after God's own heart. After all that David went through and he was going through, he, we probably can say truthfully, David was a man after God's own heart, and God was on the throne of David's heart. And no matter what David did, no matter what, no matter what came before David, we knew who David served. Even through his, 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 his failures, we still knew who David served. And one of the things I was riding with Pastor Steve in the car last night, and one of the things he reminded me of and helped me to see that, one of the things that David does so well in the scriptures, especially in terms of the Psalms, is he brings all of life before God. That, that, that regardless if it's a praise, regardless if it's a, it's a pain, David brings everything of life before God. And I think about that, just that example of David in his life, and just that message in terms of, as I was hearing from Pastor Steve, um, what that means for us. Just in the midst of whatever it is we find ourselves facing, we can bring all those things before the Lord. And, and, and in that doing, we are saying, we are declaring, we are praying to the one who's on the throne. Because if God is not on the throne of our hearts, then guess what we will continue and eventually continue to do is to take matters into our own hands. But if he is on the throne, then our lives will continue to be surrendered and submitted to him. And he will be the one who reigns, not us. And in the midst of that, as we will see in terms of the text today, God will indeed be glorified. And so it comes to our text today. Here it is now. David has been anointed as king, and we see that he is resting in his palace. Again, when I just think about palace, I don't even know if we have palaces today. I think so at some degree. But here it is. David is resting in his palace. And I stopped there for just a brief moment because David is not resting because of David. The reason David is resting is because the Lord had given him rest. The one who is on the throne has given David rest. And it just reminded me real briefly that, again, life circumstances come. David was not always in the state of peace. His house was not always restful. We know in it through the scriptures that there was countless of, you know, wars and things going on in and around David's home. And there was even, you know, war between Saul's home and David's home. But yet, in this moment, at this time, David is resting in his home because the Lord had given him rest. And I just pray, not knowing your situation some, but the reality is I pray that the Lord will give you rest from whatever situation that you're facing and whatever situation that you enter into these gates with, that the Lord will somehow, some way, in his timing, give you rest. And he gives David rest from all of his enemies. And he said to Nathan, this is David, in this moment, realizing all the Lord has done for him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a palace of cedar, but the ark of God remains in a tent. And I can just imagine David being at home, just like we are, we're, part of, we're sort of confined to our homes right now. But being at home, he realizes in this moment of being home, wow. Look at all that I have. Look at all the Lord has done. 
And here it is, I live better, if you will, than the Ark of the Covenant. Such things shouldn't be. And so David decides, has this desire within his heart and says, I'm going to build the Lord a home. And so he goes to Nathan, wise in terms of kind of the person who's been helping and guiding David, you know, even in terms of his uh, kingship. And he goes to Dave, um, Nathan and he tells Nathan kind of what's on his heart. Just like we probably do to whether it be the pastor, whether it be someone, our parents, whether it be a friend, we kind of go to them with things on our heart and say, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm desiring to do. And Nathan, being a man of God, hears kind of David's heart's cry and says, whatever you have in your mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. And at this moment, you think in terms of just Nathan and who Nathan is being a prophet, you can just think about this being a very prophetic message and saying, okay, then I can just go and actually build the Lord a home because now I have kind of uh, someone giving me the kind of permission to go ahead and do that which was on my heart. And little do we know, of course, that's not God's plan. It, 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 it was not God's plan, and, and put quotations around that, it was not God's plan that David would build him a home. And it's, it, 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 it's rather, it's something that God comes to him at night. We see in verse 4, it says, the, the, that night, that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? He says, are, uh, wait a minute. Are you the one to build me a house? I mean, here it is that David desires to do something great for God. Have you ever desired to do something great for God? And then all of a sudden those plans and what you tried to do didn't actually uh, plan out like you wanted to? I mean, here it is. It's like David really wants to build this house, and I'm sure he has his, you know, he has the blueprint. He has everything kind of, kind of ready in his own mind. But the Lord says, "No, this is not for you, David." And, and I and I stopped there for a moment, not to move too fast. I stopped there. Here it is that the Lord is refusing David in terms of this kind of act of service. But nowhere in scriptures do we see that David stopped serving God. Huh. Have, 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 you, have you ever been there before where, where you, 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 you desire to do something great for God, but yet there was kind of this no or kind of this kind of push against that which you were desiring to do? And, and I think about that. In this moment, it almost can be our tendency to think, okay, why keep serving God? Why keep worshiping him? But we see nowhere in this text or the text to come that David stopped serving the Lord, even though the Lord refused him. And then the question becomes, OK, if the Lord is not using David or is not going to utilize David to build a home for him, then who? OK, Lord, I'm sure this desire on my heart is for this. But who's the one that's going to do it? And so now, David, in this moment, I'm sure eventually once he receives these words, and we see kind of the following text in terms of verse 18 eventually going on, he would have to humble himself to the word of the God and realize that God is the one who's going to do the work, not David. And so he goes, and Nathan comes to him, and he says, I have not dwelt in a home or house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with tent and to be my dwelling. Whoever, wherever have I moved with all the Israelites of all the rulers, have I commanded the shepherd of my people, why have you not built me a house of cedar? And it's kind of like, yeah, that would kind of be, that would kind of sting a little bit. Have I ever asked anyone to build me a house? All the, the, the judges, the rulers, the prophets, those who came even before you, I never told one of them to build me a house of cedar. And I, 
I was thinking, I've been thinking, and even thinking this morning, that one of the things that we declare and we know that God is great. Would you all agree? Yes, amen. God is great. And, I, and I've been thinking about this, that at some level, probably the surrounding quote-unquote kings and earthly, earthly rulers probably have domains or houses for their kind of gods, if you will. And so kind of the surrounding people around them is kind of like they kind of showing off their God, if you will. And so maybe even David, I don't know, I'm just, you know, thinking out loud, maybe David himself wants to show how great his God is too. And he wants to build God a palace. He wants to build God a, a house in terms of for his dwelling. And I've been thinking, and I said, wait a minute. God doesn't need a house to show how great he is. And, 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 and I think about that in terms of our context. Here it is. We are under a tent. We're under tents. We are not even in the church. Oftentimes people say this is the church. And I'm reminded even through this pandemic, even through COVID, that God is not restricted to a building. That, that, that we can go and have church and glorify God at the beach. That if we so choose to, we can go, I think you said this too, Rigo, at one point, we can go to the parking lot of or Home Depot or Costco and have church. But it just reminded me just how great God really is in this moment, that I don't need a building. You don't need a building to do my work. And, 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 and you begin to think about this is God is not so fascinated, if I can say it this way, he is not so fascinated with the outward services, although they are good. What is he really concerned with then? He's concerned with your heart. Because, because that's really where the Lord desires his dwelling place to be. That, that, that at some point in your life that you would allow God to make his abode in your life, in your heart where you would surrender and say, Lord, you know what? I've, I've been on the throne of my heart for this long. But Lord, I desire that you would be the one on the throne. So if you were to gift God with something, what would you gift him with? I, I, I pray whatever that may be, I pray in the midst of that gift would also be your heart, would also be you saying, Lord, I, I want to surrender and totally give my whole entire life to you in service for you. There is no greater gift. Because when I think about the way in which God gifts us, did he not gift us his very best from his very heart, gifting us his one and only son, his one and only begotten son? Nothing short, but his very best. He gave himself. And so wait a minute, if God gives himself and we are in his, creating this image, then we too are called to give ourselves completely, withholding nothing. And so we continue. And so Nathan is having kind of this, you know, revelation from God, if you will. And he says, verse 8, now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from following the flock to be rulers over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off your enemies from before you. Now, I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest man on the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and plan and plant them so that they have a home of their own and no longer is disturbed. I think about this kind of revelation to Nathan to present to, to David. First, um, just how intimate God is in terms of his dialogue with Nathan so that he might receive to David. Have you noticed the my language? That here it is that God is not saying David or the shepherd or this person but he, he, he's saying, my servant. And, and, and we know David has truly served the Lord. 
And here it is that in this kind of intimate dialogue or relationship with David, and, and, and almost in terms of a father and son relationship, he says, I took you from the pastures of following the sheep, the flock, to being rulers over my people. And I say, why would God remind David of what he has done? Why, why throughout the text and scripture do God remind his people of what he has done? So that in the midst of whatever it is they are going through, might God be reminding them of his steadfast love for them? I'm, I'm going to say that one more time. Might God be reminding David, thus reminding us, that whatever, whatever it is that we're going through, I'm still on the throne. That, that as I was faithful to you before, I'm still going to be faithful today. Yeah, you forsake me, but I'm a God who will not forsake you. Though you have abandoned me, I still, I still love you. What a mighty God we serve. When, when, when we think about God still loving us through it all, that whatever it is that we're going through, God still says, I'm going to be faithful to my people. Wow. That's good news. There is no better news to know that God still desires to have an intimate relationship with his people, despite whatever it is, whatever their past was, that he desires that they would have a better future, kind of a new hope, if you will. So take your situation, your circumstances that you find yourself in, and say, Lord, what is it that you desire to do in and through my life? As the church, what, it is that, what is it that you desire to do in and through our life as your church? God's love continues to be faithful to David, and I hope that will be a reassuring message to you that God's love will continue to be faithful. And then he goes on and he says to you, um, he reminds David, I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all of your enemies before you. Again, just this reminder of how God continues to not only love David, but protect him, provide for him, and continue to make a way for him. And oftentimes we understand God to be a way maker, where oftentimes in life, when there seems to be no way, somehow God provides and makes a way. Again, such good news that, that when you think about where the Lord has brought you from, take a moment and think about where the Lord has brought you from. Had it not been for God, you would still be there. Had, had it not been for God, your outcome would be different. David will potentially probably still be shepherding the sheep or doing something else. Who knows? But God so loved David, so loved us, that he, he, he saw us in the midst of our situation and says, I have greater things in store for you. Yeah, yeah, you started off as a shepherd of a flock, but I want to raise you up to be a shepherd of my people. What great love the Father has bestowed on us that we might become his children. That's love. Where would you be if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God upon your life? And it continues and it says, David, I want you to know, now I will make your name great, like the names of all the greatest men on earth. So David, you don't have to worry about trying to be great in your own strength. God says, the, are you noticing all the I wills? It says, I will be the one who will make your name great. I will be the one who will establish you. I will be the one who will provide a place for my people, Israel. And so even though David somehow seems like he is the initiator, God is the one who initiates. You, you receive that? God is the one who continues to initiate his love toward us. Because while we were yet in, in, in sin, Christ died for us. 
He's the initiator. He initiates to us. And he, and he tells David, you don't have to worry about my people. I got them. And, and, and I'm not David. I'm not Nathan. But I hopefully want to say to you, God has you. He's still on the throne. He has your back. And it continues, and it says, and, and, and there's a verse in there. It says, I will provide for a place for my people and will plant them so that they have a home of their own and no longer is disturbed. One, I, la I, I thought about that. I said, wait a minute. God is going to provide a place for them, and then he's going to somehow plant them. I'm not much of a gardener, but when I think about something being planted, that means that hopefully, eventually, it's going to bear much fruit or it's going to grow and produce something that's going to be beneficial to the one who planted it. So wait a minute. If God is planting his people, then that means he still has work for them to do. And then I think about that. Again, I always like to bring us into kind of the text, if you will, that God oftentimes plants us in different places. And, and, and although it oftentimes is not what we may want or what, what we may seem to be the right thing in that moment, God knows what he's doing. And, and, and then I thought about this. I say, wait a minute. Sometimes it seems that when the Lord is planting us, we oftentimes miss kind of use it or get deceived or deceived ourselves that God is burying us. Think about that. It's a difference. When you bury something, then what? There, there really is no hope for, for that which is buried. But he planted them, and he was planting them because he still has a hope and a future for them. Something to think about. And he continues to go on, and he says to his people, he says, I have appointed leaders over the Israel, and I will also give you rest from your enemies. And so again, he's reassuring David again that he's going to continue to give him rest over his enemies. And then the Lord declares that you, the Lord himself, will establish a house for you. And when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from you, your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He, listen to these words, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the, the throne of his kingdom forever. I mean, here it is that David is trying to, if you will, give God, present God with something that's temporary. And God says to David, in turn, I'm going to give you with something and bless you with something that is eternal. Look at the difference. David is presenting something temporarily that eventually, if he does choose to build it, which God does fulfill that, of course, we know in terms of first kings um first chronicles that god raises up uh, a seed from david in terms of his son solomon he raises up him to build god's home and so that is kind of temporarily fulfilled of course and through solomon but in the midst of that god tells david i'm going to do something even beyond your seed if you will in terms of solomon i'm going to build up a house for you that is everlasting there will be no end to the one in whom I raise up. And I think about that, I say, wait a minute, because usually when someone gets on an earthly throne, someone eventually replaces the one on the throne. But it seems like there's going to be one who's going to remain on the throne forever. Do you hear that? There is one whom God has sent, whom God has provided, who's a descendant of David, who God has placed on the throne and remains there forever. And, and I, I don't want to keep you all waiting, but his name is Jesus. And in and, 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 and through Jesus, one of the things that we see that God fulfills this prophet, this, this prophecy, in and through Nathan and, and David at this point, that in and through Christ, his kingdom has no end. No matter what earthly king comes and rises and falls, 
Jesus is still on the throne. And, and, and that is our hope. That is our hope, especially as we really think about what season we're in. This is our hope. That, that, that this reef in terms of Advent that we light and we do in terms of the four weeks in Advent, you remember the, the, the reef? That, that, that kingdom is a circle. It's everlasting. It has no end. That as, as, as Jesus came, he came to reign and reign supreme. No end to his kingdom. And he continues and goes and says, verse 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him and with the rod of man, with floggings of affliction by man. I just want to pause there real briefly. Verse 14, it says, I will be a father to him and he will be my son. And you think about just how this relationship began between a father and a son. What the father does, the son is also required to do the same. What the father does, the daughter is also required to do the same. So, so you think about this in terms of just from an earthly perspective. Parents usually try to pass down things to their kids from generation to generation, hopefully that they would truly reflect the one who has led them over the years that if David is truly a follower, a representative of God, then he truly is going to have the heart of God as well, if he's going to do it right. And he tells him, he says, I'm going to be a father to this son, and this son is going to be a son, a child to me. And, and we know none other that Solomon, of course, is the son of David. But eventually, God raises up the son of David. And when we think about Christ and his earthly ministry, he did nothing out of his own will. Everything he did, he did out of what the Father sent him to do. And then I think about that as his children, as his servants today. God requires us to do the same, not in our own strength, but by his grace, by his power, by his spirit that empowers us to actually follow and obey his will. Just like the son, hopefully we can also do the same. And then he goes and says, of course, when he does wrong, I will punish him. With the, the floggings of man, um, I would afflict him. And then verse 15, it says, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, who I removed before you. And so again, here it is, God reminds David of what God has done. But then God not only reminds him of what he has done in terms of removing Saul from the throne because of Saul's disobedience, but he reminds him of his steadfast love as well. He, he tells him, my love will continue to remain with him forever. And I think about that as a, as a child. How reassuring is this to know that our, our parents' love will never, never be taken away from us. And God is sending and reassuring David, my love will always be with him no matter what. Therefore, my love would always be with you and those to come after you. And then he goes on and says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Nathan reported to David all of the words of this entire revelation. Again, kind of what do we do with this text and just kind of how do we kind of conclude it, if you will. Hopefully, very simple five words. It is, it's a reminder of the throne. It's a reminder that God is still 
on the throne. And I want to kind of read some of the things that I wrote, and this will kind of be kind of the last things I'll say this morning. God demands not only an outward service, but he also demands, commands an inward service as well. He does not desire just to make his presence or he really truly desires to abode and make his presence his dwelling in our lives and in our hearts. And he can only do that if we surrender our lives to him. That he, he truly is the one who is on our hearts. And Jesus, the son of David, is of course, as we see, the great fulfillment and genuine promise of God to David. And not only David, but to also to us. The people waited at this time, especially during Jesus' earthly ministry. Remember, they referred to him a lot as the son of David. They waited in anticipation of God sending someone who will fulfill this promise and who will set them free and deliver them. And we see, again, how this was fulfilled in and through Christ. And the people at that time were waiting in anticipation for what was to come. But we continue to wait in anticipation for what will come again. And we wait in anticipation and serve God, hopefully, rightly, waiting until Jesus returns again. And I think about four things in terms of just Christ and just who he was, his position, his power, and his practice. One, just in terms of the person of Christ. Yeah, we see in terms of them declaring him as the son of David, declaring him as from the seed, uh, the lineage of Abraham, but we truly must declare him and acknowledge him as the son of God. Then it goes on in terms of his position. Jesus is indeed the king of the heavens and the earth and the fullness therein. He's the king of kings. And as we talk, the Lord of lords, and this is who he is. And in this position, we know that the Father has given him all the power and authority. And I think about just that power in which Jesus was, what the Father bestowed on the Son. And we think about the, the, the power the Father, God, bestowed upon the kings at this time and what they were supposed to do in terms of the power in which they had. And I think about Jesus and how he utilized his, his, his power. He utilized it for good. He didn't take advantage of this situation and that situation. He didn't take advantage of this person and that person, but he used it for the good and the service of God to deliver and save God's people. Again, he did nothing out of the will of the Father. And just in terms of his practice, Jesus built the name of God, the Father, a house, a place where God dwells. And in through Christ, our faith in Christ, we become united in him, receiving his Holy Spirit in our hearts and hopefully transforming our lives in such a way that God would dwell in our midst. So I pray this morning that you would not only just be reminded of the one that is on the throne, but that you will allow him to be on the throne of your hearts, not just now, but forever and ever. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for our sins. Lord, we acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of our lives. Lord, despite all that we, as your people, are facing today, Lord, we continue to hope and be reassured, Father, that you continue to be on the throne. And Father, I pray for those who do not know you this morning. I pray for those who uh, are hesitant or maybe straddling the fence and wondering, can I truly trust this one in whom the word of God speak of? Father, I pray that you would not only soften their hearts, but you will use your word, your people, to speak to them in such a way that they might know, Lord, that you truly 
are who you say you are, that you are a God who saves, you are a God who delivers, you are a God who gives rest, and you are a God who continues to desire to build your kingdom and and through your church today. Father, we pray for those who do know you. We pray for those who have walked according to your ways, that you will continue to empower them to be a faithful people, a people who desire not to be the one on the throne, but continue to allow you to be on the throne of their hearts. Father, as we depart today, Father, may we never depart from your presence. May we never depart from following you. May we continue to, by your spirit, serve you and serve you only. Lord, help us to be a people who not only acknowledge you, but serve you as the God who's on the throne. And so, Lord, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Brother Eddie, um, would you mind coming to play a verse or two of just go tell it on a mountain? And as Brother Eddie comes, um, just hopefully, you know, that would be kind of our declaration as we go, even depart from this place today, that we would really truly go and tell others of this hope that we have and just this reassurance that God is on the throne. No matter what your situation or circumstance is, he's on the throne. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Say it again, say it. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Last verse, and lo, they've seen it. They all bow down and pray. They all travel on together. To where the bird was way Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is one Say it again, say go Tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Amen. Well, let us pray as we depart. Um, uh, Father, again, we just thank you again for today. Thank you for your word and how you continue to uh, draw us unto yourself. Uh, Father, we pray as you have indeed spoken to your prophet Nathan to speak to, to David, Lord, that we would go um, not in our own strength, not in our own way, um, but go and declare to others of the hope that we have in you. Uh, Father, that you are not a God who just promises and forsake your promises, but you are a God who continues to keep his promises. And Lord, we just thank you for being faithful to us and power, empower us to be faithful to you. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.